Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Laura Jagged, and thank you for showing up today and listening to this episode of the How to Life podcast. This is episode 23, and this show is inspirational in nature today. My guest is Mike Lander, who has followed a very interesting path that has led him to his current title of procurement director. Among other things, he negotiates the sales of businesses and handles millions and millions of dollars. But this show is not about how to become a procurement director. It's about how to ignore and tune out those people, those words, the voices that tell you that you're less than, not good enough, not smart enough, not educated enough. You didn't come from the right environment. It's about tuning into the voice inside of you that says, don't listen to them. Listen to your own voice. Self-confidence is something that takes some nurturing. It's nice if somebody else can do that for you, but that often doesn't happen. It's very easy to allow someone else to define who you are and tell you what you can or cannot do. But with awareness that it is you who defines who you are, and with a little encouragement from others who soared despite being told that they couldn't, you can learn to listen to the only voice that matters, yours. And you can make your life what you want it to be. Mike Lander heard a lot of no in his life, but he didn't listen. And he's here to tell you about his story and wants you to know that your own power and sense of self can take you anywhere. Hi, Mike. Thank you for joining the How to Life podcast. It's an honor to have you here. Hey, Laura. How are you? Doing well. Will you please introduce yourself to everyone and tell us what you do and a little bit about who you are? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's really kind. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, what I do now is basically I'm a, uh, a portfolio advisor. My clients are companies that turn over between a million dollars and about $50 million. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. What is the actual title of your job? That's a very good question, Laura. I, I, I think my job now, because I work with so many different clients, it is definitely kind of consultant and advisor to entrepreneurial companies. But the point of this podcast is not about what you do or how you become Indeed. what you are. What this is, is about how to tune out those who tell you that you are less than or those yeah. who try to hold you back, which always stems from their own insecurities. So Mike, will you please tell me your story? You have an interesting story. Tell us how it all started. Sure. Sure. So I was adopted when I was six months old. I've always known I've been adopted. Um, Born in a place called Blackpool in the UK, and then moved to Manchester when I was six months and I was adopted. Uh, Very lovely family that was adopted by uh, my parents. I've always called them my parents. They are my parents. Um, But my parents were really hardworking individuals, but didn't have, we didn't know any lawyers. We didn't know any accountants. We didn't know any doctors. Um, They were just working class people. They worked hard and they provided money for the family. Neither of them had degrees, but both of them understood the power of education. And they said, we'll always help you invest in your education. The more you want to learn that we will find the money, whatever we do, however we do it, to to help you in your education. And that's kind of stuck with me for life. You know, I still call myself now a lifelong learner. Having a curious mind in your life will take you a very, very long way. And then... I kind of like, you know, like all children kind of went through school, um, didn't enjoy school at all. My secondary school, which in the UK is 11 to 16, um, you know, 11 to 18, I I hated it. I really didn't enjoy it. Rough school, I lacked self-confidence, you know, very, very tough kids around me and just really not a nurturing environment at all. I call it a kind of survival uh, year or years where I learned how to survive in that kind of environment. They weren't gang kids. But they were tough kids, tougher than me. So at 16, I left. Um, in the UK at 16, you often go on and do A-levels. And I didn't want to do that. So I left school at 16. Uh, and I went away and I tried to find a job. I was good with my hands at that point. You know, I, was, uh, I loved fixing cars. My grandfather, who was quite a big influence in my life, he had a, he had a garage. I was fascinated by his garage. Lots of tools, 
and we'd make all sorts of stuff. And so I was very practical and tried looking for a job. And I got, I got rejected by, wow, I must have sent off 20, 30, 40, 50 applications, don't know. And I got rejected by about probably 25, 30. I got interviews for about four or five and no job. And I went to one interview uh, with a big engineering company in, in the northwest of England. And the interview didn't go that well. And the guy at the end said, you know, well, you're not very bright. Uh, you're not very capable. Uh, we don't think you'll make much of yourself. Um, we might be able to put you in as a sweeper on the shop floor, uh, but I'm not even sure about that. And at that point, you kind of start thinking, well, <laughs> do I accept this? I didn't. No. And it was, a, it was definitely a turning point in my life. Because it was that moment where no matter what your level of self-confidence is, inside as a human being, you kind of go, well, is that, is that really my lot in life? There must be more to that, surely. You know, I see people being successful around me. There must be more. And so I decided that I would I'd try and do more. And we had a friend of ours, a friend of the family, who was a lecturer of a local college. But um, without me knowing, he went out of his way. He talked to a local firm called Ferranti, who are an engineering firm. He convinced them to open up a new uh, role, an apprenticeship role, uh, in what was then called quality assurance. And they took me on. They offered me a job without me really knowing. I got offered a job as an apprentice in this quality assurance group um, in an engineering company. And they offered me day release at college to do one day a week uh, studying. And I couldn't believe my luck. I love making things. It's in an engineering company, and I get to learn as well. But it's not school five days a week. I've got this huge thing about learning pathways. We all have different um, speeds at which we go in our lives, and we're sometimes ready for academic education, and we're sometimes not. And I think the way the system works, in the UK, I think it's now mandated you've got to, do, uh, you've got to be educated until you're 18. I think it's insane. I think it's nuts. Because certain young people, probably quite a lot of young people, don't want to do that. They want to go out and work. And at certain points in your life, you realize, well, if I want to get on even further, there's a big knowledge gap. Well, to fill the knowledge gap, I need to go and get some training of some kind. And whether that's university or whether it's going through an online training program, doesn't matter what it is, but you need to fill that knowledge gap. But it has to be when you're ready, not when the system thinks you're ready. You know, we have this problem whereby we try to fit kids into the system rather than getting a system that fits the kids. So 16, I got this job. And for whatever reason, it, it, the whole thing really worked for me. I had a job. I was getting paid. I was doing things that I loved. I was making things. Uh, I was actually, we, were, uh, we developed um, electronic systems for all sorts of different companies. So I became an electronics engineer. I became quite good at it. I went to day release at college. I loved the, the studies at college because I could go to college, learn something, go to work and apply it. So that blend of work with college for me was perfect. Um, and then one day, a letter arrived in the post from the college. And the letter said, congratulations, you've won student of the year. And I rang the college and said, I think you've made a mistake because I'm not an academic. And they went, no, 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 no. You've got the highest marks in the year in your subjects. You are, in fact, student of the year. And it was the first time academically I'd had some kind of affirmation that maybe I was capable of doing intellectual study. It just had to be right for me at the right time. So what did that recognition do for you? It definitely affirmed for me that, okay, if I've got the right kind of subjects and the right environment to learn within, yeah, I, I can pretty much do anything. Mike, where did you go from there? So carried on doing my apprenticeship, um, got to about the age of 20, 21. Um, and what I'd realized was with engineering, I loved it. I loved doing the work. But to get to be an engineering, a, a, a true design engineer, there was definitely an academic piece missing. So my maths um, was nowhere near what it needed to be to be able to do the next level of design. And sure, you could learn on the job, but it would take a lot longer. And so I spoke to a bunch of uh, colleagues who had all done degrees. And they said, you know, if you're going to accelerate your career, go and do a degree. You'll never look back. And they said, you'll, in, you'll, have, you'll get two amazing things out of it. Firstly, yeah, you'll get the degree. 
But more importantly, you'll meet all these amazing people who have got very different backgrounds and you'll just enjoy it. It'll be fun. And so I applied to various uh, universities and to my great surprise, I, was, I got accepted. And I went to a place in the end called Sheffield in uh, the UK, uh, which was known for its engineering, engineering and control systems. And it was really tough because most, imagine most of my peers, A, they were 18, I was 21. And B, they'd all done A-levels and I hadn't. So the first day of lectures in maths was they said, let's just review the A-level syllabus in an hour and then we'll move on. And I was like, okay, I didn't understand anything that they said at all. Let me ask you this. Did you feel insecure about that, that you did not have those A-levels? I almost left. Did it occur to you that you got accepted to the school even without that? Yeah. Did, I, did that help you a little bit? What helped the most was I met people. There were about five of us who had gone through the same path. And we all quickly looked at each other. And the university went, okay, yeah, we, we need to help you. And they did. They stepped in. They put on extra lessons and they helped. Um, steep learning curve. Uh, but on the engineering side, I was way ahead of all the other students. Um, and so I went through university and had an amazing time. I uh, came out with a very good degree. Met some amazing friends who I'm still friends with now. Were you working at all during university? Uh, funny enough, I got sponsored. So my engineering company sponsored me to go to university. And in the holidays, I used to work for them. So I got paid in the holidays, which was fantastic. Did you continue working for that company once you were done with your education? Uh, the plan was yes. So I, um, I said to them in my third year, uh, it was a three-year course, I said, that, great, yeah, I'm ready to come back. And just as I said I'm ready to come back, they said, ah, the firm's gone bust. This is, a, this is a big engineering company. I mean, like a big, big engineering company. They were, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 people. And uh, they'd merged with a US firm and it had gone really badly wrong. Uh, and they said, there's no place for you. There's no place for anyone. But you did get an education out of it. Yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. Isn't it funny how life uh, unfolds before you? And right. how did you feel about that now? You're like, okay, I have this degree, but I have no job. Yeah, I was like, okay, I'll go and find a job then. Because by that right. point, I'd become pretty self-resilient. And so I, um, I didn't apply to any job adverts at all. I never have. I wrote to, I think I, I only wrote for about three jobs. And um, one was in um, just outside London, engineering firm that did very specialist imaging systems. And my third year um, thesis was in imaging systems. And I said, look, did this thesis. Seems to go quite well. Know quite a lot about imaging systems. I'd like to come and work for you. And they went, oh, as it happens, we've got an opening. Come and see us. And they interviewed me and I got a job. So you had uh, 10 years of work experience and you had this degree. You're a good fit. I was a good fit. You're actually ahead of the game. A lot of people who go to school and then come out of school with absolutely no experience in, in the work world are not really a good hire. It's, nope. it's actually very smart to have someone who has um, real-world experience as well as philosophical experience in school. Exactly. I'm actually not a great believer these days in the, the formal education system. It works well for some young people. And if you want to go on to really high standard academic institutions like Harvard or MIT, Stanford, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, the system works really well for that. But I think where we've got to in education is I don't think there'll be a, it won't be a very natural thing to go to university. It'll be a natural thing to keep on being educated, but there'll be online courses. There'll be programs designed for young people in certain industries whereby you learn the skills required for that industry and then you get a job. Um, So the old fashioned education system that teaches you subject matter expertise I think is a dying, it's, it's a dying um, trend. I think many people are opting not to go into traditional university, work a little bit, or a- apprenticeships, you exactly. know, going right into a school that'll just lead them down a path quickly without yeah. this broader liberal arts education. And I don't think the mentality anymore is like when I was growing up, it's like, oh, you have to get a degree. You, you absolutely exactly. have to. You do not have to, and you can be quite successful. So I'm now at the age of 24, got this job, met a whole lot of new friends, um, really enjoyed the work. And um, 
I'd met some consultancy companies who were working with the firm I worked for during that period. And I kind of really got fascinated by the whole consulting world about how you solve complex business problems. And at 29, I decided engineering was great, but a bit self-limiting. And so I was more interested in the business world than I was just engineering by that point. So I thought, mm, okay, I want to become a, a general manager or run my own business. I, I, I know nothing about finance, nothing about marketing, nothing about sales, nothing about strategy. So I did an MBA. So I left work and I scraped money together and did an MBA at a place called Cranfield in the UK, known for its uh, MBAs with people that are from kind of engineering and finance backgrounds. And my friends said, all my friends said, you're mad. Are you crazy? What on earth are you doing? Why would you do this? And again, back to your point of the podcast, just because they said you're crazy, they were great friends and they still are friends. Doesn't mean I have to take their advice because I knew where I was going. You had a plan and it didn't matter that it didn't make sense to them. It made sense to you. Correct. How long did it take you to complete that MBA? uh, That was a year in the UK back then. That is no big deal. A year passes in a blink of an eye. So whether you do it or whether you don't, that year is passing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So you jumped in. The year passed. And now at the end of that year, you have an MBA and a new direction. I went from engineering project management into banking and marketing. And I really loved it. It was Barclays Bank in the UK at the time. And a big project came up with McKinsey a huge, huge global consulting firm. And they arrived at Barclays to do a big project. And they were looking for people that worked for Barclays to work on the project with them as what we called client-side consultants. And the deal was basically, part of the deal with Barclays between McKinsey and Barclays was they had to train our people. So I've got this MBA, and I've been doing marketing and product management, it's fine. Um, And now what you want to do is you want me to work on this big change program, and you want me to be trained by McKinsey who are one of the best consulting firms in the world, to be a consultant. That sounds all right, because you're going to educate me again for free. So I did that for about a year. Then PricewaterhouseCoopers were doing a project inside the bank, another massive consulting firm, and they wanted me to do work on their project. So I worked on their project, more training, more learning, uh, more working with senior people in the bank. You kind of had this momentum of people paying to educate you. It wasn't an accident. You know, I say it kind of jovially, but I've got this thing also about, you know, people say you were just lucky. No. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. If you want to call it luck, um, what luck is, is massive perseverance, an awful lot of sweat and perspiration. And eventually an opportunity t- turns up that's right. And you take the opportunity. That's luck to me. Yeah. Luck is also you had an intention and you were open to whatever way it came to you. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, I mean, more, probably a lot more than I do, Laura, about kind of the, the way that the mind works. We have filters in our minds. We train our minds to filter things out that don't fit. And so if you pick the wrong plan or the wrong model, you'll filter out anything that doesn't meet that model. So the That's trick correct. is change the filter. Yeah. Widen the filter to let more things in and more opportunity will turn up. And then after that, um, a very senior manager within the bank said, look, Mike, I need to tell you something. We can get you to work on projects inside the bank forever. You are a really, really good consultant. So we don't want to let you go, but you need to understand you're highly unlikely ever to sit on the board of the bank because you've never come through the banking network because you don't come from a banking background. So he said, if I were you, I'd think about the choices you want to make and where you want to go. I'm not trying to get rid of you at all, the opposite. I'm trying to make you aware of the culture that we have here. And I'd hate to see your talent wasted. That was very kind of him. It was really kind. Because then I thought, "Mm, what do I enjoy doing? Banking, marketing, or consultancy? I really enjoy the consultancy. I'll apply to a consultancy firm. So I talked to McKinsey and they said, you won't get in. Because although you've worked with us, um, you don't come from Oxbridge or Stanford or Harvard or MIT. And uh, you don't come... Uh, with a, um, you know, a blue chip pedigree. Uh, so um, although we know you're a great consultant, you're not one of us. So this is more than once you've been told, well, you're not good enough for us. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a recurring theme in your life. And yet, once again, 
you yeah. paid no mind to that. Yeah, exactly. You knew your worth, you knew your value, and you knew what you wanted to do. You're yeah. like, okay, well, if I can't fit in with the Blue Bloods, I'll go somewhere else. And I did. And I arrived at, I, got, I applied to KPMG. And again, what they liked about me was lots of practical experience, had an MBA, had worked with McKinsey and PwC, knew how the consulting process worked. And I had a deep expertise in the electronics industry because I'd come from engineering. How long were you at that firm? Uh, four years. Um, what happens in these big consulting firms is basically the reason that a lot of people join is to become a partner. Your partners earn a lot of money, half a million dollars a year plus. So a lot of people join those firms to earn the big money. I, I actually didn't join them to earn big money. I, I joined them because I love the, um, the work. And I love the environment and the, and the pressure. And um, I went through the four years and I got to one below partner. It had almost killed me. And I said, I'm leaving the firm. And they're like, <laughs> you must be mad. <laughs> what? Are you insane? What do you mean you're going to leave the firm? Uh, no, I do want to know, why did you decide to leave the firm? And when did you start thinking of that? So I left the firm because... I didn't want to be part of that big kind of like blue chip corporate structure. What was basically the way partnerships work is, although you collaborate, you're kind of frenemies in many ways because your fellow partner, you know, you get partner drawings and your partner drawings are based upon your billing. So the more you bill, the more your partner drawings, your money. Well, if that partner over there has got a project that I can get, I'm actually incentivized to, to kind of not steal, but get that project rather than them. So it's a very combative environment. So hence frenemies. <laughs> Did that take a toll on you at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I didn't like that. I'm a collaborator. Now, I'm yeah. going to talk about your friends and your family. They're all watching you. And they right. have told you before, this is a very dumb decision. Why are you doing <laughs> this? So now they see you about to be partner and you decide, I want out. What did they have to say about that? Uh, oh, my friends thought I was crazy again. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for the second time, uh, I think virtually all my friends said, uh, you're crazy. But so, no matter what they said, you felt certain about this yeah. decision. And you had a plan? Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to become an independent consultant. I wanted to go out on my own and do my own work. So yeah, so I went doing some freelance consulting work. And then I, um, I wanted to, I thought I'm going to build a consulting business. And um, GSK, big pharmaceutical company, I knew people there. I went to go and pitch a piece of work to them. And there was a very interesting guy that I met who was the global head of mergers and acquisitions. And what that means is basically when, when GSK buys companies, uh, then someone has to integrate those companies into GSK. And he ran all of that. Uh, so he had a re really big role. This guy was an ex-SAS officer. So ex-Special Forces. Yeah, I thought I was a good project manager. Wow. You know, this guy was... <laughs> really really good and so I went to go and see him to try and pitch some work to him and it was really interesting he said to me at the end of it he said it's been really interesting Mike I'm glad I've met you he said can I give you some feedback I went absolutely definitely and he said buying from you is like eating from a smorgasbord a smorgasbord is a big table full of all sorts of interesting bits of food that you could eat and he said it all looks amazing I just can't work out which is the bit that's fantastic. And that's all he said. And I went, wow, that was interesting feedback. <laughs> and having reflected on it, it was obvious. It was like, yeah, I, trying to be all things to all people doesn't work. More and more in life now, I believe, being an inch wide and a mile deep is probably where most of us need to be. If you want to be an independent kind of consultant or an independent entrepreneur, or a solopreneur, whatever we want to call them, you do need to have a real specialism with a market that's small that has a real problem that you can serve. You know, it really is true. It was true back then, and it's true now. You know, if you look at what this guy was saying from GSK, he said, look, if I need support on integrating a big company that we've bought, I'm going to go to KPMG or Booz Allen or McKinsey. I'm never going to go to Mike Lander. He said, it's not going to happen, Mike. I need, if I need a really excellent project manager 
who's brilliant with process and tools and great at leading a team, then I might use you. But don't fool yourself. You're not a business. You're Mike Lander. It was really, really good feedback. And you took it it that way. Oh, absolutely. Because it did something which um, I I still think to this day was uh, remarkable. So I I, I went off doing some other freelancing work as a project manager um, working for other firms. And I worked with a consulting firm uh, that I knew very well because I knew the two people that owned this consulting firm. And they were running a big change program in education. And one day they said, we're about to bid for this big contract. And they said, we've run it for like seven years and we both want to retire. And over a lunch, he said, I'm looking at selling the company. And I said, um, I'll buy it off you because I'd thought it through way in advance. Mm. I knew at this lunch, because I'd heard they were trying to sell the company. I thought this through, I planned it out. And that was my moment. And, I, and he said, but you can't buy the company. You haven't got the money. And I said, if I, can find the, if I can find the money and we can agree a deal, would you sell it to me? And he said, I don't know. There's two of us, me and my business partner. He said, look, I'm not sure it's serious, but I'll go and talk to him. Two days later, he came to me and said, okay, let's talk about a deal. So I, I worked out a valuation and I got them to a position whereby the valuation was just about acceptable. So I knocked on a big bank's door in the UK, one of the leading four banks, and said, um, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I want to buy this company. I'd written a business plan because I was good at writing business plans because I'd done my MBA and I'd been a consultant and I knew how to write business plans. And within about two weeks, they said, we'll lend you the money. And then they said, as long as you can put in your own money. I'd been squirreling away lots of money in the background for rainy days. So I'd been saving this money up. I'd now got a price that the client had agreed to uh, take for their business, a bank and my own savings pot to buy this company. So I then was in the pub with my friends, <laughs> again, same friends. And um, I said to them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this company. <laughs> <laughs> and they all spat their beer out and they all laughed. <laughs> they haven't learned their lesson yet they after all this yet. time. They really haven't learned the lessons. And they said, you're crazy. <laughs> you know, it's too good to be true. It's never going to work. It's never going to happen. You're going you're gonna to splash all your savings on this, on this ridiculous idea. And they just laughed and kind of walked off. And, and your response to that was you just shrugged it and say, watch me. And, yeah. And I was like, okay, you know, might be crazy. I don't think it is because I'd spoken to a number of other people. So you get input from various people that you respect. And you had done your own calculations and yeah. you know yourself. And I, I had the inside track. I'd worked for these people. I knew all their consultants because I'd worked with them before in different companies. I knew the client really well. The client knew me really well. If you are looking to do a deal of any kind, the best deals that work are where you've got some kind of unusual inside knowledge. I mean, some kind of knowledge that maybe no one else has got. Experience, access to people within the company that people don't have, you know, knowledge that someone else wouldn't necessarily have, outside experience that you can apply to something to make it better, something that is the, the unique bit about why it's the right deal. And I had that. And we had agreed a deal and we went to a completion meeting and I bought the company. And then my friends all went, no, really? And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I bought the company. So that I then ran that business and I scaled it from 50 people to 120 uh, over about a three-year period. Um, paid the bank back in two years. Um, and it was very profitable. And I owned the whole business. It was mine. So... At the end of that, so just before we finish that bit of the story, what happened was I did another crazy thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good at doing what people According think. to your friends. According to my friends. Um, I built a special needs school from scratch. And so we built that up. Uh, that almost killed the business. So we almost went bankrupt. Um, but I'm a very rigorous planner. I'm a very structured person. I had good advisors around me. Uh, we'd saved a lot of money to get us through the, the dark periods. And we built that up. Uh, and I sold that about six years ago um, to some private equity people who wanted to invest in special needs. And uh, yes, yeah, so we sold that for 
yeah, a very, very, very good valuation. And that special needs school was completely separate. Com- completely separate. Just a completely different business, a side yeah. business, a side hustle, so side to speak. Hustle. <laughs> Quite a big side hustle. 45 pupils, 120 staff. And can I, so where I am now is we sold that business. I built another business, a, another consultancy business, sold that. Um, and now what I do is basically, I don't, I don't want to employ anyone ever again, thank you. <laughs> I want to work with freelancers that can help me build up a small advisory business with some very specialist things that we do. I, I ended up being a, um, what they call a procurement director as well. I'd ended up buying, wow, 400 million pounds worth of services for clients, negotiated hundreds of deals. So I found myself as a very good negotiator. And now my small uh, marketing agency clients, I help them negotiate better deals with buyers in big companies. And I enjoy that. It's fun. Mike, give me a summary of what you would advise this young audience if they are unsure of themselves, but they want to go somewhere big, but there's the the voice of self-doubt or you can't do it or the peanut gallery laughing at you. How do you stay focused? Find a few people around you that have got different experience, probably a five or 10 years ahead of you and where you are and have done something that you admire. Collect those people around you. Have your friends, sure. But a lot of your friends will say that you are crazy and it's not for you and stay where we are and do what we do now and just stick with the gang and you'll be fine. But if you do that, you'll stay where you are. If you want to move, find new people with different experiences, number one. Number two, try some experiments. If you look back at my story, I basically tried a few things out that were relatively low risk and made it work. You can't do that in one step. You know, the Chinese say step by step. A long journey starts with the first step. Yeah. Well, make a small step. Lesson number three is you need to work out some kind of midpoint of a, of a journey. No one's got a life plan these days, I don't believe. But you need to have like, so where do I want to be in a couple of years, two or three years? If I'd have had no vision at all, I'd have gone and worked for the garage down the road. And then probably the fourth thing is you've got to, you've got to keep on kind of reinforcing that you are capable. You've got to take the evidence points that you get, the very tiny steps, and use them to go, I, oh, I could do that. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I could do the next thing and, and then the next thing. And that, I think, is a really important kind of lesson learned. And the last thing yes. I would say, if you look at everything, if I look at everything in my life that I've done that I've really enjoyed, it's based around a passion. If you can tap into what your passion is, any passion that you get involved with in your day-to-day life, chances are you'll make a good success of it. Because we, we, we tend to succeed at things that we are passionate about. It's going to be fun. For goodness sake, don't pick something that you hate. So just find, you know, tap into your passion and then try and work that into your, your way of earning money. And you probably won't go far wrong. It's true. Success is not one big giant leap. It is a series of tiny little wins that lead up to one big giant success. Mike, thank you so much for this very wise advice and your very inspiring story. I think it's going to bring a lot of benefit to everyone. I hope you all enjoyed this interview. Mike Lander, thanks so much. Best to you always. Thanks, Laura. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Those were very true and wise words from a man who started out insecure, just like most of us. But with every step along the way, you build more and more confidence. Look for the wins, no matter how small they are. This journey is a series of little steps, hopping from one place to the next and being happy with where you are at any given moment and anticipating what's coming next. It's fun. It really, really is. Enjoy it. Enjoy each part because it's adding to your growth and your future self. You can learn more about Mike Lander on my website, 
The show notes for this episode can be found at howtolife.com slash 023. Join me next week for more life lessons, encouragement, knowledge, and inspiration. If you would, take a moment now and please subscribe to this podcast and you'll be notified when the weekly show is available. Every once in a while, I will publish a bonus episode and you'll know about that as well. If you're loving this show, please give it a five-star rating in Apple or your favorite podcast platform. You can find me on Instagram at How to Life Now, my YouTube channel, How to Life, or send me an email to drlj at howtolife.com. That is it for today. Have a wonderful week, everyone. A week full of yes. Take care, have fun, be kind, and make sure you notice the wins. All the little wins, there's a lot of them. You are doing so, so well. You got this.